Welcome to the Albany Book Festival Online, presented by the New York State Writers Institute at the University at Albany. You can learn more about the festival and find direct links to independent booksellers at our festival webpage, albanybookfestival.com. Follow us on social media and hear for more videos from the Writers Institute. So, David Rode is a journalist, a two-time Pulitzer Prize winner, an online news director for The New Yorker. He received the Pulitzer Prize for International Reporting in 1996 for his coverage in the Christian Science Monitor of the Srebrenica massacre in Bosnia-Herzegovina. He shared it again in 2009 as part of the New York Times team covering Pakistan and Afghanistan. He spent seven months as a captive of the Taliban in Afghanistan before escaping in June 2009, an experience he chronicles in the book, A Rope and a Prayer, a Kidnapping from Two Sides. His new book is In Deep, the FBI, the CIA, and the truth about America's deep state, an illuminating history of a right-wing conspiracy theory, the deep state, its demonization of government, and its ongoing dangers to democracy. Please give a thunderous Albany welcome <laughs> to David Rhodes. David, it's good to see you, even if it, even if it needs to be virtual. Um, we want to talk about the book, and then with, with your permission, we'd also like to ask you some questions about the Taliban as well, if that's okay. Absolutely. And Mark, that, thank you for that very, very kind introduction. I, I want to apologize. I apologize to all of you. Um, my wife has severe uh, asthma, and we're just she's been at risk um, from... Uh, COVID from the beginning of this, uh, where we were, we spent um, most of the pandemic up in Maine with family where I'm from, and we're just back in New York now. And so I, I apologize. I just, out of respect for her, uh, I'm doing this virtually, and I, I, um, I'm just grateful to all of you for understanding today. And you can ask me anything you want, um, from the deep state uh, to the Taliban. And thank you, Mark, for that kind introduction, and to everybody at the festival and, and the institute. So, so David, you, you, you tell us in your book um, uh, something of the, the kind of peculiar and, and uh, unexpected origins of the, of the idea of, of, of the deep state. And uh, you tell us that it, it was first applied to, to, Tur to Turkey and to the uh, Turkish military. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, and I... Um, it starts in the 1990s. It was a term that political scientists used. They talked about the deep state in Turkey. That was basically an effort to prevent the emergence of democracy um, in Turkey by the Turkish military. It was then applied to the, you know, Egypt, same thing, the Egyptian military, different presidents, Hosni Mubarak and others trying to prevent the emergence of a democracy there. And um, the interesting thing was that it really the term was first applied in the U.S. in 2007, um, a, an academic and English professor at UC Berkeley named Peter Dale Scott um, accused the United States government of being a deep state, sorry, deep state in a book he wrote called The Road to 9-11. And uh, he talked more about, you know, and, and I want to talk about this. It's a, I think it's, a, it's an issue on the left and the right. I mean, there's a deep suspicion of the government on the left also. So Peter Dale Scott, his first use of the deep state, he was talking about the military industrial complex, which is what people on the left tend to fear, a, a deep state slash military industrial complex that pushes the country into war after war. Right. So um, d d does, uh, you know, this, uh, you know, whatever the merits of the arguments about the uh, Turkish military, w was the idea of the deep state misused to pave the way for the rise of an autocrat like Erdogan in, in Turkey? Or is, is it entirely irrelevant to that. No, I think there was, you know, a history of the, of the Turkish military subverting civil society and, and democracy in that country, the intelligence agents, the agencies there also. And, and we can, and I can tell already, I'm going to keep my answer short. And thank you, Mark, you're, he's, you've got great questions coming at me. And we have, we have had a problem in our country of law enforcement agencies 
um, abusing you know, uh, their surveillance powers, which I can talk about also. So yes, a very big problem in Turkey. And we've had uh, periods of, of kind of deep state surveillance and, and government abuses in, in the United States as well. I just want to uh, check the sound one more time. We, we've had a little bit of feedback and I, I just want to make sure, can folks hear David? Okay, yeah, okay, good. So, um, so and then the, the idea uh, of the deep state begins a new life in America, not, not as a conservative theory originally, right? But as, as a liberal one, um, can, can you talk about that? Yeah, so that's Peter Dale Scott and his talk about the military industrial complex. And then the interesting thing about Scott's book after it comes out in 2007, there's interest in the deep state and, and then it, and it comes from the right. So Peter Dale Scott, again, a UC Berkeley English professor is invited on Alex Jones, Alex Jones's you know, radio program, the far right conspiracy theorist, Alex Jones. And Alex Jones embraces um, this liberal theory of a military industrial complex or a, a deep state. And it sort of metastasizes, I would say, uh, again, uh, Peter Dale Scott's books in 2007, it kind of grows in the late 2000s. Um, 2001 happens. And you do have folks, again, on the left and right who think that, well, first, actually, there's a belief that like the Oklahoma City bombing was staged. That starts appearing on the right. Then there's a uh, belief that the 9-11 attacks are staged by the CIA to you know, launch uh, wars or the Pentagon. Um, and then on the far right, there's, you know, and this is, I'll just be blunt, you know, shameful lies about the Sandy Hook attacks, the shootings in the school there being staged as well. So what's interesting, and I'll talk more about this, and this even relates to Afghanistan, you know, my fear is how the, the sort of power of conspiracy theory, I saw it in Afghanistan, I saw it in Bosnia, but the power of conspiracy theory to appeal to people on the far left and the, and the far right. And I'm, I'm very worried about how polarized we are in this country. So, so how, how dangerous is this and, and why is it so powerful? Why is it so appealing to some, some groups, many groups? It's, it's hard to know. I mean, we can, you know, and I'm really eager to take folks' questions and I, I want the audience to drive this. But I think we, we have like a, one of the largest uh, information crises, crises, excuse me, in the United States, I think that we've had in our history. Part of it, I want to be fair, is the news media. I want you to criticize me and ask me about what we in the news media are doing wrong. People don't trust us anymore. We're seen as either far left or far right. Um, and then I think it's also, you know, the web. Um, it's an amazing platform, the web. I, I love it. I, I love technology. I'm, I'm, uh, I work on the website at the New Yorker, not the print side. I'm proud of that. But, you know, never before in human history has any, you know, any individual had the power to just sort of post their theories online and reach, you know, millions, hundreds of millions of people. And, and so, you know, it, it, the power of that technology to amplify conspiracy theories has never existed before. And just, and I, I promise, Mark, I'm going to keep them short, but just the, one of the reasons I wrote the book is that here's the breadth of the problem. It was 2018, there was a Monmouth University poll Three out of four people uh, polled in 2018 believe that a, a, quote, group of unelected government and military officials either definitely or prob probably manipulated or directed U.S. national policy in secret. That's three out of four, around 75 percent. And eight in 10 Americans believe that the federal government was currently monitoring or spying on the activities of, of U.S. citizens, improperly spying, that is. Um, and by 2019, that had become a little more partisan. It's uh, 83, you know, and, and it, it divided the country like, you know, as we are now. But 83 percent of Republicans thought that a deep state was trying to undermine then President Trump and only 10 percent of Democrats did. But this is a, a widely held uh, fear. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to ask a, a few more questions and then I'll, I'll be turning it over to the audience. But um, to there's truth to this, isn't there? That there is a, 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 a deep state or at least an internal resistance within uh, administrative government. Um, it, 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 is, is there truth to this? So I mentioned the abuses earlier and I'm gonna talk about one of the main characters in the, in the book. Um, his name is uh, Fritz Schwartz. Um, his, his full name is Fritz A.O. Schwartz. Um, 
we're all New Yorker, New York State or New Yorkers. So his initials are FAO Schwartz. His grandfather started the famous um, toy store in Manhattan. Um, and he uh, was an investigator uh, in a committee that was created in the 70s. Many of you may know this already called the Church Committee. And it was created to look into the abuses that were carried out throughout the Cold War by the FBI, by J. Edgar Hoover's FBI, and then also by the CIA. And I was just, Schwartz is a character in the book. He's a lovely, lovely man. Um, so he was the legal counsel for the Church Commission. It was started in 1975 in the wake of Watergate. There'd been news reports about the CIA surveilling uh, Vietnam War protesters. And you, many of you have probably heard of, of the FBI abuses under J. Edgar Hoover. Anyway, just Schwartz was a Manhattan, is a Manhattan blue blood. And so for his investigation as a lead counsel in the church committee, he interviewed dozens of senior CIA and FBI officials. And again, I'll try to keep this short. He is, you know, he went to Harvard. He, he went to a prep school in Manhattan. He's a wasp. So he thought he would feel more solidarity or, or just be able to identify more with CIA officials. And this is the mid seventies. It's still, you know, institution dominated by sort of wasps and Ivy leaguers. And um, he expected not to identify with the FBI officials. Many of them tended to be more working class. They went to um, schools like Fordham, which is a terrific school. But it was, you know, he expected it, expected to, to identify with the CIA folks more. And interviewing him was fascinating. He, he's sort of asking the CIA about all these things they did throughout the Cold War improperly inside the U.S. and around the world. And he couldn't figure out when CIA officials were lying to him. They were so effective at lying that he just he, he was amazed by it. Whereas the FBI agents, and we'll get into this more, um, they, they, they said they kind of knew at times. They were so afraid of communism in the 60s and 70s. They, they abused Martin Luther King and for race, you know, racist reasons, but also thinking he was a communist. Anyway, the FBI agents would say that they felt they had to, like, take matters into their own hands to protect the country, you know, from the threat of, of communism. And, you know, so it's that rationalization that you need to kind of stretch the law or break the law to defend the country. And that's a very dangerous thing. And I, I worry that could happen again. But, but theoretically speaking, uh, if there is a deep state that resists the impulses of a would-be dictator, shouldn't we be rooting for it? I mean, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, thinking, of, thinking of someone like General Mark Milley who was trying to keep access to nuclear weapons out of the reach of an unstable leader. Um, isn't he a hero of, of the deep state? So here's our challenge. Like, how do we strike a balance? Because I, I think that we, you know, we have elections every two, four and six years. And the, the power of deciding when we go to war, I think, should primarily be from our elected officials. Um, what came out of the church reforms in Watergate was this idea of not having too strong a president who can, can do these kinds of things. So um, the, you're interesting to mention the Milley situation, and you may all, maybe all that you saw this in the news recently, but there are, you know, currently there's no law right now that presents, prevents a president from unilaterally like carrying out a, a nuclear strike. Um, and I think a lot of what the Trump presidency showed folks was that a lot of post Watergate reforms that were put in place um, an independent justice department. So I talked about the problems with the FBI, which is part of the justice department. You know, after J. Edgar Hoover, you're supposed to have an apolitical FBI director and they change, you know, every 10 years uh, to prevent like an all powerful president from improperly surveilling people. There's this federal court called the FISA court where a judge decides if the FBI can surveil on you and your political activities. Um, there's, you know, in the 70s, there were these intelligence committees, oversight committees in Congress. So you have hopefully ambitious senators and members of the House showing if the executive branch and the CIA is carrying out abuses. And that all failed, um, you know, I would say in the Trump era, in that the partisanship became so powerful that uh, at least I think the legislative branch wasn't, <clears throat> excuse me, holding the president um, as accountable as they should have. So you had generals like Mark Milley taking things into their own hands. Um, he spoke to a colleague of mine, Susan Glasser, about um, at which he's since wrote, written about, about his genuine fears um, as January you know, 20th approached 2021 that, that President Trump would try to carry out some sort of coup. 
So I'm, I'm an employee of the state. I, I, uh, I recognize a good number of folks in the audience and I, I know that, that they are employees of the state or of municipalities, uh, school teachers, civil servants. Um, what, what role do we play in this, uh, you know, right-wing imagination of, uh, you know, as co-conspirators in, in, the, in the deep state? What, 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 what role do we play as individuals? So um, where, what's interesting, and back to a little bit of history, is that, so it's the deep state thing is kind of floating around and Alex Jones and this kind of stuff, uh, that kind of part of the world. But throughout the 2016 election, the term deep state was never invoked by Donald Trump. It was first invoked, and I'm gonna, this, is, this has to do exactly with, you know, sorry, I have like my, my, my stepmother, two of my aunts, you know, are all school teachers and members of the deep state, if you will. So um, the first time in the 2016, comp, uh, sorry, context of 2016 that the deep state term emerges is December 12th, 2016. Trump has won the election. He's, you know, awaiting inauguration and a 4,000 word um, article appears on Steve Bannon's website, um, Breitbart News. He's the managing editor at that point. And it's entitled The Deep State Versus Donald Trump. Uh, it's written by an anonymous author who uses the pen name Virgil. And, and again, I'm, I'm going to keep the answer short. But in this essay, so Virgil's, and so I, as you can tell, there's all kinds of definitions of the deep state, and which is, makes it hard to grasp. But his definition, Virgil's definition, was that all federal, state, and local government employees are members of the deep state. So are all policy experts. Anybody that works as a contractor for the federal government, journalists, and basically the entire um, establishment, the kind of Washington establishment, and again, local government employees, firefighters, police, teachers, um, is this kind of, and it's a kind of a, for conservatives, their fear of the deep state is a big administrative state, this ever-growing government bureaucracy that's using up more and more resources. Anyway, so Virgil warns that on December 12, 2016, that a great power struggle was uh, about to begin between this giant, you know, deep state full of government employees and Trump. Before we start asking about uh, the, the Taliban, which we certainly want, want to ask about, um, just one last, last question about, about this. Why does this idea resonate with folks who benefit from administrative government. Uh, Trump's base is frequently made up of people who, who need the safety net um, provided by government. Why, why does this appeal to those who are so vulnerable and who stand to benefit from infrastructure spending and, and from, from you know, health insurance and, and, and so on and so forth? So I, I think it's, um... I think throughout history, when people are frustrated, when there's you know economic downturns, uh, when there's huge economic inequality, which we have today, uh, I'm you know I'm sitting here in New York City. I'm an editor at the New Yorker magazine. I'm a member of the uh, media elite, and, and and I think that these theories are more appealing to folks when that happens. I, I do think also that um, we can you know and I, we can talk about this more in the Q and A, but I think that the media has is sort of concentrated on the coasts, on the East Coast, and you know, is the spending time and and flyover country is, which I think is a terrible term, and so I, I think that there is some accountability to um, I, I would say you know the Washington elite, the journalistic elite, to not talk down to Americans. I think that that's used very effectively by politicians to to discredit us. Um, and, and but I think it's it's a sense of grievance and, you know, I, I, it, it works politically. I think we have to face that, that when people feel they're not getting a fair shake, they're, they're going to be more likely to believe in a conspiracy theory. You, you were held captive by the Taliban for seven months as a journalist in Afghanistan in 2009. And, and partly because of that painful experience and, and because of your, your deep knowledge of that country as a journalist, you, you've, you've become something of a go-to expert on what the Taliban are really like um, in, in, in recent months. Um, what, what would you like us to know about the Taliban? 
Well, it's a very large movement, and I and I you're I hope you're hearing. I'm I'm trying to be non sort of. I'm trying to be fair. I think there's a need for journalists to be factual. Um, there's lots of opinion journalists, and people should have opinions, and that's great. But I, I think that one one way, uh, we, and I can get to this sort of in the end. But I, I think that the the best or one of the best antidote against um, deep state conspiracy theories is for you know journalists and and government officials, nonpartisan public servant government officials to abide by like the rules we have. I know that like, you know, government employees, federal employees are barred by the Hatch Act from engaging in, in politics. And so the, the answer I think to lies and conspiracy theories isn't sort of more lies and conspiracy theories. It's, it's really believing in these ideals. So I wanna be fair to the Taliban. It's a very broad movement. Uh, most of them are, are from rural Afghanistan, but um, there are elements of it that are very violent and deeply conspiratorial and deeply dangerous. Um, I was kidnapped by a faction of the Taliban called the Haqqani Network. Um, a Taliban commander invited me to an interview outside of Kabul. I went with two Afghan colleagues. This is way back in 2008, many, many years ago. And um, I just got married to my, my lovely wife, who I mentioned earlier. And um, uh, it was a commander who'd done a couple interviews already with European journalists. I met with a French journalist who'd been interviewed by that commander. And she said, you know, it's different. You're an American you're at more risk, but I think you'll be okay. And when we arrived, it was myself, a, a, a very brave Afghan journalist named Tahir Ludin, and a brave Afghan who was sort of our driver and kind of lookout named uh, Assad Mangal. Anyway, we arrived at this interview just outside of Kabul, and we were kidnapped immediately by this commander. He smuggles us uh, through three Afghan provinces into the tribal areas, the mountains of Pakistan. And we were then held by, and this is the group I wanted to get to, the Haqqani Network. Um, they are one of the most brutal factions of the Taliban. They carried out, you know, many, many car bombings and assassinations in Kabul. Um, and they held me captive for seven months. They, they operated a long running uh, kidnapping network where they would grab foreigners uh, in Afghanistan, move them into Pakistan. They had Bo Bergdahl, the American soldier that was held for seven years. Um, there's currently an American they still hold named Mark Frerichs. He's a carpenter, a contractor who was sort of helping on a water project in Kabul. He was abducted. He still remains uh, being held by the Haqqani network. Um, in the new Taliban government that was just announced, the head of the Haqqani network, my kidnapper, uh, um, is the interior minister. He is the chief law enforcement official in Afghanistan. His name is Sirajuddin Haqqani. Um, he's on the FBI most wanted list. And so I'm biased about the Haqqanis, but I'm, you know, very, I, I, the, what's happened in Afghanistan is heartbreaking. I, I don't know if we can argue about, we, maybe we should have left sooner or we should have left now, but it was certainly a chaotic withdrawal. And it's very hard to see the Haqqanis running law enforcement um, in Af Afghanistan. So uh, just two, two more questions about the Taliban before we, we open up to, to questions. Uh, from the audience. Um, so in, you, in your view, was the uh, collapse of the Afghan government um, inevitable in the, in the wake of the withdrawal? I don't think it was inevitable. If we were willing to keep anywhere from 2,500 to 5,000 troops in Afghanistan, I, I think the, the, the government and the large cities would have held. And, you know, we, we, have a, we have to, we as a nation have to decide whether that's worth it or not. If you remember, you know, uh, the Obama administration pulled U.S. troops out of Iraq and that government largely collapsed. Baghdad didn't fall, but ISIS took control of most of the country. And we, you know, now have several thousand U.S. troops in Iraq and that somewhat stabilizes that country. Uh, Syria, there's several hundred American special forces troops and that seems to stabilize um, that country. So it's it's a um, it's a question like we have had troops in, in Germany and, and Japan and South Korea, you know, for decades. Um, we are propping up these government with our troops. These governments will fall without some American troops, particularly American air cover. That was a key thing in Afghanistan that was lost when we started to pull out. So I don't think it was inevitable, but I also I'm very critical of Ashraf Ghani, the Afghan president and Afghan security forces for not not fighting uh, more. And I was shocked at how quickly Kabul fell. Okay. And one last question. What, what would you like us 
to know about the American allies who were left behind? Well, I would, um, I just, and one quick thing on the Taliban, it just plays into this whole conspiracy theory. Um, when I was uh, held in captivity, it, it was a window into the Taliban. And, and I, again, I'm worried about, the, the Taliban are not here. No one here is, is like the Taliban of uh, neither party. Um, but it shocked me how much my guards, you know, when I was in captivity, believed that the 9-11 attacks were staged. You know, they had been told that it was a secret, you know, uh, a plot by the CIA and the Mossad to bring down the Twin Towers uh, to create a pretext for uh, Muslim countries to be invaded. And they believed that American troops were uh, making Afghans forcibly uh, convert to Islam. They believed that Afghan women were being forced to work as prostitutes on U.S. Um, military bases. And it was, it just, and I saw a similar thing on, on different sides of the conflict in, in Bosnia when I covered it there. So it scares me, you know, what's what's happening here in the U.S. And just on the Afghans, I, I guess I'm, and I'm trying to emphasize, you know, every group has its good people and its and its bad people. And Afghanistan is a um, it's a very divided society. The countryside is very conservative. Seventy percent of Afghans or 60 percent, I think, live in the countryside. And they many people in the countryside support the Taliban. They're they're much more conservative religiously. But what you're reading about and you'll hear about is this sort of new generation of Afghans or urban educated Afghans who want to be modern. They're proud of being Muslims, they're devout Muslims, but they want their country to be uh, like Dubai or, or Turkey with more democracy. I don't want to give Erdogan much credit, but uh, they want to be modern and Muslim. And, and it was a whole generation, hundreds of thousands of them, women and men in, in the big cities who embraced democracy. They, they loved uh, Twitter. You know, there was Afghan Idol. It's a version of American Idol. They, they loved pop culture and TV. Um, all of that's gone. And, and, and the, the chaotic, the, sorry, the, the, sorry, the U.S. withdrawal was chaotic. It was poorly planned. There were warnings to start getting people out all summer. The Biden administration didn't react to those warnings. Um, it was amazing. They were able to get out 120,000 people in 10 days. But the estimated number of Afghans who back the American project, the total number is about 300,000. So 100,000 gets got out. That's 200,000 Afghan allies who face Taliban retaliation that are still trapped in Afghanistan. So uh, David Rode has told us that uh, he is willing to take questions about anything. Now, what, what we're <laughs> going to need to do is the, the logistics of this during COVID are, are going to, uh, I think, require people coming up maybe one at a time. I'll take Gene Dam first since he's got his uh, hand up. So if, we, if you can come up one at a time to the mic, if you can't come up to the front and you want to shout out the question, I can amplify it and uh, and, and restate it um, for, for you so that it, it, it uh, it's heard by, by David and also gets recorded on our, our recording equipment. So, Gene. Uh, can you hear me okay? I can. Thanks, Gene. Uh, I'm trying to think of uh, how this uh, deep state concept uh, could be useful. And uh, let me put it this way. About five years ago, I was in Pakistan myself and uh, had some friends uh, explain Pakistan to me. Uh, I see you have elections, you have an elected government. Exactly. They said, oh, forget that. They didn't use the concept deep state, but they said the military and the intelligence forces, they're really calling the shots. So in that sense, it seemed like a deep state in Pakistan, no matter who the elected people were. Yes. What do you make of that? I, I agree, and I, I, will, I am biased because I, I think I was held for seven months in Pakistan because the Pakistani military uh, sheltered the Taliban. They sheltered the Haqqani network. Um, the Pakistani military didn't like the, the, the American-backed government in Kabul for the last 20 years. They saw them as too pro-Indian. So uh, the, one of the reasons we failed the biggest reason I would say is corruption by the Afghan government. Um, that's their responsibility. They, they failed. Many, many Afghans, I just want to point out, fought. Uh, 60,000 Afghan police and soldiers died over the last 20 years. 
The next largest group to die was a roughly 50,000 Taliban fighters. I mean, these are Afghans, this rural, I'm sorry, this rural urban divide is real. And then about 40,000 Afghan civilians died um, in this conflict. The largest number were probably killed by the Taliban and different attacks and bombings. But as you, you saw, we've killed many people in, in drone strikes. So I, I'm, we failed. And then lastly, we failed because of the Pakistanis giving the safe haven to the Taliban. There's, there's kind of no way to win if the Taliban are gonna have a safe haven uh, inside Pakistan. And just before I forget, um, what we need in societies is a kind of balance where, where power is diffused. And so there's a lot of power in elected officials and we can reelect them or throw them out every two, four or six years. And then there's you know, government institutions that are sort of enforcing basic rules and norms and that they're kind of competing with each other. Um, so, so, cause it's the concentration of power that I fear. And I, I think this is like our constitutional system, our three branches of government. And what scared me in the Trump years was sort of the, I think the courts stood up in the 2020 election and, and were a check on president Trump. But I think that, um, it's the issue is that the legislative branch has sort of stopped acting as a check on the presidency. If, if it's, you know, my party's president. Uh, members of Congress tend to let the president do whatever they want, and that, that's a very dangerous thing. Question here. Yeah. Hello. Um, I'm very curious to know how you were treated while you were in captivity uh, on a day to day basis, and were you interrogated? Was there torture involved? And I would love to hear about the escape, too. We were treated well. We were treated well. I mean, I, I'll be honest in that. And this is um, the the first thing that that the um, captors did when they when they kidnapped us was they beat Tahir and Assad, the Afghan journalists and Afghan driver who was with me. They hated them more than me. They saw them as traitors, um, as Muslims, and and uh, it was very clear from the beginning that that I was safe because they saw me as the most valuable prisoner. Um, in an earlier kidnapping, the Taliban had first, uh, when they couldn't get the demands they wanted, they had um, beheaded the driver in that case. So Assad Mangal, who I mentioned, uh, was always terrified that he would be the first one to be killed. Uh, then it would be Tahir and then me. And, and I had been foolish. I went to interview this Taliban commander for a book I was writing. I had, it was my ambition to write this great post 9-11 book. And I was wrong, and I regret it to this day. Um, we all survived, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and then it was strange. There were guards that were kind to me, um, and I told them about how I'd recently gotten married. This is the same wedding ring I wore in captivity. They didn't steal it from me. Um, we sang, uh, they, they knew sort of some Western pop culture. Uh, one night we all sang the, the Beatles song, She Loves You. Uh, together and they had sort of put their Kalashnikovs like on the floor uh, around us as we sang these songs. And then there was another guard who was sort of darker. I mean, I think it's like human nature. You have good people and bad. And he came in and this is the web. He looked up and I was in, I'd come home. I'd been based abroad for years, but I was an investigative reporter for the New York Times at that time when I was doing this book. And um, he said, I looked up online that this guard, David's an, an interrogator. He's an interrogator for the FBI. And, you know, I think he just made that up, but it's this problem of this explosion of, of online information. So um, kind guards and, and cruel guards. And the last thing is, um, you know, I'm alive today because um, Tahir, the, the Tahir Ludin is a journalist. Um, about, it was, we were held for seven months. I would say at about month five, um, Assad, the driver, started cooperating with our guards. He feared he was going to be killed first. He, you know, and so when we, we started talking to Assad, the driver, about trying to escape, and Assad told our guards, um, he told our guards that Tahir and I were thinking about escaping, and we, you know, we were very angry about that. And so we eventually moved to a house that was close to a Pakistani military base, and Tahir uh, was very clever. He would go outside and buy food with the guards sometimes, and so he knew when we moved into this new house that we were very close to this base, and Tahir and I decided um, to try to escape. Um, I found a car tow rope in this house. We moved into it. It was just sitting on a shelf with a bunch of wrenches and car tools. And essentially, we 
waited. Um, it was a night when there was power and there was a big, I don't know if you guys know what a cooler is. It's a very crude air conditioner, but it was running that night and making a lot of noise. And we basically waited till our guards were asleep, snuck out of the room we were in, uh, took that car tow rope, uh, tied it to a wall. Uh, we went up on the roof, tied it to a wall on the roof, and then lowered ourselves into uh, a little alley outside. And then uh, to here, we walked through the streets. Um, he had twisted his ankle. I had like ripped my hand open on the rope and we made our way. Um, he wanted to walk to Afghanistan and we were pretty close to Afghanistan at that point, but we decided to try to go to a Pakistani mil that Pakistani military base. And I'll, you know, never forget we were walking down the street and there was like, we were in the middle of the street and I was like, Tahir, I didn't want to say anything, but why are we in the middle of the street? And I heard shouting and people load their rifles. Uh, and, it, and Tahir turned to me and said, you know, put up your hands, you know, don't move. And I thought the Taliban had recaptured us. And Tahir said, this is the base. And he had correctly led us, you know, through the darkness and through these streets to this base. We were nearly shot at that point. They thought we were suicide bombers. Uh, we took off our shirts. Um, uh, Tahir um, requested protection under Islam and under Pashtun Wali and Afghan tradition. And we were brought on that base by a young, moderate Pakistani army captain. Um, he let me call New York and I was able to reach my wife. And here I am today, uh, thanks to uh, Tahir. Uh, we did leave Assad behind that night because we thought he'd tell the guards. Um, he was able, he was released several weeks later. And so uh, Tahir and Assad, I'm happy to say, are now in the U.S. Uh, and safe. And just a final thing, I'm sorry, Mark. Um, <clears throat> Tahir uh, became a U.S. citizen. It's been 12 years since uh, we were all uh, held captive together. Um, he applied to get them out of Af he brought he's brought about half of his children into this country as is his legal right as a US citizen. He applied to bring his wife and the rest in March. One, when President Biden announced the full withdrawal, President Biden in April said all US troops are leaving by September 11th. There was a mad rush of applicants for visas. And so Tahir was uh, trying to get his family, get their visas approved. Again, it's his right to bring his wife and children here but there was such a backlog that Tahir's wife and children were actually trapped in Kabul when the city fell to the Taliban. I wrote a piece about this in the New Yorker recently about trying and failing to get them out of Kabul all summer. I mean, April, May, June, I was trying to get them out July, no luck, August 15th, they're trapped there. And they were eventually, um, they were in those huge crowds of people trying to get into the airport and after several failed efforts, they were uh, snuck inside with the help of an Irish journalist named Jane Ferguson, who saved their lives. Uh, Tahir's uh, wife and children are now at Ramstein Air Force Base. And we were just talking last night. He's, he's hoping they can come all the way to the US soon. So uh, Javi, I think you had your hand up. Do you... No, okay, okay, yeah, so, somebody else? Yes. Thank you very much. Um, I, I wanted to ask about um, drone strikes and the impact of, you know, you were talking about rural folks that siding with the Taliban. I mean, uh, you know, what choices do people have, right? I think we in the US have to think about what, what it looks like and what choices people make based on what it looks like as far as where their best safety is going to be. So I was wondering if you could talk about, you know, how are we going to get that balance where, you know, can we understand how, how we're viewed in this country, how many bombs we've dropped, how many places we've, you know, done horrific things, you know, and this is a perspective people have. I've traveled in the Middle East. I studied Arabic for five years. So I know that perspective. I know what people see. And I think we have to think about how, how, how does that play? And, and what are we gonna do about that? Because we can't just talk about the Taliban because we're talking about people who are trying to align their lives for safety, right? Yep. Thank you. And the, you're absolutely right. And the Taliban you know, are very strict in law and order. They, they bring um, security. And then, you know, so when I was captive in Pakistan for the seven months, I was in the tribal areas where they, so they were carrying out drone strikes all, all around us. Um, and um, the Taliban actually believed that the, the, the drones were trying to find me and kill me because I was such a valuable uh, 
prisoner. But um, the, the drone as a tactic, the Taliban saw drones as a cowardly way to wage war. Um, and and one of the, another one of the reasons we lost in Afghanistan is that it was always clear from 9-11 itself until the evacuation, you know, at the end of August, that Americans believe that American lives were worth more than Afghan lives. And so we come up with these like high tech wage to wage, wage war. We, we have 1% of the American population serving in a volunteer military. I mean, part of the problem with the 20 year war in Afghanistan was that no one paid attention to it. And, and I, I don't, we shouldn't, so I'm not giving you a great answer here, but I, you're right. Anyway, the, the people think we kill civilians. People think we're cowardly. Uh, drone strikes don't, you know, they don't stop movements. You have to address the underlying causes of movements. And so that's why we had this kind of stalemate for 20 years in, in Afghanistan. And, and I, I'll just say this. And, and I, it's like, if we're going to wage war, we should wage war like intensively, you know, frankly, as, as what happened in World War II, you know, the whole society. And if, you know, and like in Vietnam and so many Americans died that, that we, you know, we lost and, and that's good. And that, but at least Vietnam was shorter than this war. So it's, it's a strange time. And I, I think that, um, you know, we, when it's easy to wage war, we wage too many wars. And, and um, anyway, you're absolutely right. And, and, and now that we've left Afghanistan and abandoned up to 200,000 allies, that, that isn't going to make anybody trust us either. Since we, we won't be doing a book signing, I, I'd like to take a couple more questions. Um, so uh, do you have questions? Raise your hand high if you do. Okay, I'm not seeing any, any, oh yeah, okay. Sir, come forward. Hi, uh, first of all, thanks for being here. I just wanted to ask, how do you separate the sort of legitimate political, politically scientific concept of a deep state from the, like, what is the dividing line? Because we saw in the rush of these wars that just ended or ended 10 years ago, there was sort of a very credulous, uh, what's the word, collaboration between the media and sort of these elements of people within these organizations that were looking to, you know, I, we could say they were war hungry, they were hawks. So how do you divide, like what is, because as the gentleman said, it, it is a useful concept. So how can we use it effectively? I, I think there, there have to be these, you know, checks on the, on the, on the deep state, you know, that there, there has to be uh, courts that can declare surveillance illegal. There has to be congressional committees that can say, you know, the FBI shouldn't be, you know, searching people's houses. Um, you know, uh, there has to be checks on the NSA and the kind of surveillance they're carrying out. Again, this, this um, diffusion of power. And I, I guess um, post 9-11, I'll, my last kind of summation thought, and I, I, one of the characters in my book is the was the CIA station chief in Kabul. He was chasing bin Laden before 9-11. What I found in like, um, and so I, I think there was a post 9-11 in the media too, there was this fear of, oh my God, there's gonna be a giant attack and a chemical attack and all these things. And, and that was, you know, argue, you could argue that was used by George Bush and Cheney to go after Iraq. But anyway, I think there are people, you know, there's, there's bad journalists, you know, kind of bad teachers, you know, bad generals. But I, I think that many people in government or in professions are trying to do the right thing. Um, the danger isn't to me like humans tendency to be greedy or, or, you know, sadistic and want to do bad things. The danger is the human ability to rationalize the human ability to think that there is some, you know, plot against this country or a plot against my you know, political party or my family or my way of life. And when we rationalize, you know, the use of violence or, or illegal things, that's when things get so dangerous. So I think there was a lot of rationalization after 9-11 about the way we reacted that led to this, you know, overkill that killed so many civilians. So um, I just want to say that, again, the best antidote to conspiracy theories, I think, is is doubling down on our kind of democratic system and, and, you know, neutral journalism and, and rigorous, you know, 
uh, academic review of, of things and open debate and, and not, um, you know, descending into this level of kind of conspiracy theory and fear mongering, if that makes any sense, maybe that's idealistic, but this, this dispersion of power, lots of different media outlets, regular elections, parts of government competing with each other is what we need, not this, this concentration of power that can be so, so dangerous. Uh, one last question. So Joe. I uh, thank you. After 9-11, we knew that all the terrorists, they came out of Saudi Arabia and we knew the names and they were training in Florida and so on. The logic would have been to go after the Saudis, but they seem to always get a pass, maybe because of oil and so on. It seemed to me that would have been a lot. So why did we go into Afghanistan, which didn't cause this, and always avoid doing anything against Saudi Arabia? I think that we've, you know, I, I found, I, I was in Kabul when it fell in November of 2021, and I found, I went in Al-Qaeda houses, and they had like lists of recruits. They had, I found a flight manual from, a Microsoft, I'm sorry, a manual from a Microsoft flight simulator. So I do believe that they were Saudis, the hijackers, but I do believe they were trained in Afghanistan and that Bin Laden was based there. And then, you know, on the Saudis in general, yeah, it's oil, you know, it's economics. And, you know, economics is always sort of what distorts our, our policy more than anything else. And I, I think it's absolutely true that we should be holding the account, the Saudis much more accountable for 9-11. And and right now, Mohammed bin Salman, you know, who who murdered, sorry, who murdered Jamal Khashoggi, a, a heroic um, Saudi journalist. So, and I guess I would, you know, again, it's this trying to view countries as rich. So there's good Saudis, there's Jamal Khashoggi. The problem is, you know, Mohammed bin Salman, this Saudi prince who's, you know, an autocrat. Um, so you're you're right. Um, but I, again, I just the last thing. If you go back to the church reform and you go back to Watergate and you've had the FBI and J. Edgar Hoover, you know, decades of abuse of Martin Luther King, of, of uh, you know, they were surveilling the John Birch Society on the right. The country rose up after Watergate and reformed its institutions, divided the power more, as I've, I've talked about. And I think we can do that now, you know, as a generation. I, I don't want us to be cynical that, you know, it's hopeless to kind of ease the inequality um, ease the division we have. I, I think we, we need new norms, new rules, new laws um, to, to prevent abuses from happening. But, you know, we can do it. And if we're cynical about it and hopeless, that just helps these people that are spreading information and concentrating uh, power for themselves. The book is In Deep, the FBI, the CIA, and the truth about America's deep state. David Rode, thanks so much for joining us. If you appreciate our programming and would like to support the Writers Institute, you can find out how at nyswritersinstitute.org.